Hello again, Nicole Mashburn, and today we're going to cover the eye and vision. So we're continuing our lectures on the special senses, uh, and we're going to focus uh, in this particular lecture just on the eye and vision. Um, the eye is very important. Uh, we get so much information about our world from our vision. Uh, in fact, 70% of all your sensory receptors are located in the eye. So we get an enormous amount of our uh, information about our world from our visual uh, perception, our cortex, and the receptors inside of our eye. And we actually use about half of our brain, so half of the cerebral cortex is involved in processing visual information. So not only are we uh, seeing an image and we're, uh, we're actually perceiving that image, but we're also interpreting that image, uh, we're making memories from that image. Uh, so we're using a lot of brain power, if you want to use that word, uh, in um, processing our visual um, interpretation of our world. Um, as important as the eye is, it is pretty vulnerable. Uh, it's open to the outside, but it does have some protection. Um, it seems like we can see most of our eye, but actually you, don't, you only see kind of a small area of the eye. Most of the eye is actually encased in the orbit of the skull. And so your eyes, so remember the orbit of your eye, we, you've made that up with um, seven bones uh, of your cranial and facial bones make up the orbit of the eye. And inside there you also have muscles and fat. So the eye is pretty, pretty protected on the, kind of the top and the bottom and the back side. Just the, the front side is kind of exposed. But even the front side has its own layers of protection. So let's talk about some accessory structures of the eye just uh, to tell you what they are and what they do. Um, obviously eyebrows and eyelids and um, eyelashes. Uh, I'm going to put eyelashes in there as well. They all play a role in protecting the eye. It keeps things from getting into your eye. So uh, as things are uh, falling from your forehead, maybe sweat, the eyebrows help to, to deflect the sweat out of your eye. Uh, your eyelashes help to catch dust. Uh, when you blink your eye, uh, that's a protective mechanism if something's coming towards you to cover your eye and also to, to brush uh, dust and debris out of your eye. So those are used for protection. You also have something called a conjunctiva and it's a clear layer. It's actually the, the outermost layer that covers the entire uh, white part of the eye and uh, again it, it serves as a protective function. And if you've ever had conjunctivitis, that's also known as pink eye, that's an inflammation of that conjunctiva. Uh, you also have a lacrimal uh, an apparatus and lacrimal Lacrimal means tears, and so you have tears that help keep the eye lubricated, but also uh, these tears have enzymes and like antibiotic properties that help keep the eye free of uh, disease. And then you also have muscles. You have muscles in, that are uh, surrounding your eye that allow your eye to have upward movement and downward movement and then side to side movement. So they can move up and down and then lateral and medial. So if you look at someone's eyes, you can see they can make all of those different movements. So uh, we have those muscles as well. I want to give you just a little bit of information about the lacrimal apparatus. Uh, this goes back to when we talked about the bones. And a lot of people, if you say, hey, where are your tear, you know, where are your, where are your tears made? A lot of people point to the right in the middle of their, uh, of their face uh, on either side of their nose because that's usually where we see the tears, but that's not where they're made. The tears are made in the lacrimal glands, which are located in the orbit uh, above the eye, kind of lateral to the eye. And they make the tears, and then the tears are going to flow across the eye. And as you blink, that's going to push those tears to the inside, to the medial portion. And that's where your lacrimal duct actually is. There's actually a little canal here uh, called the lacrimal canaliculus. And then you have an actual uh, nasolacrimal duct that uh, goes all the way down into, back, into the back of your throat, the nasopharynx. That's why when you cry, you kind of get kind of watery snot in the back of your throat uh, because they're connected. Uh, you may have already figured this out if you've ever blown your nose too hard and you felt air come out your eyes. Uh, if you haven't done that, uh, don't necessarily try it. It's not a great thing. But if you have, you go, oh, okay, yeah. So, yeah, those, my back of my throat and my eyeballs, my, my uh, tear ducts uh, are connected. Um, just as an aside, you can Google popcorn out of the eyes. And so there's this guy who takes popcorn and puts it in his mouth and then blows real hard and that actually comes out um, his uh, tear ducts. So that's just for free. You're welcome to Google it. It's kind of creepy. Okay, so let's talk about some uh, structures in the eye. 
Uh, there's a ton of structures, and you're not responsible for all of these. I'm <coughs> sorry. I'm going to point out the ones you need to know. Um, so the white part of the eye, so this is called the sclera. So when you see the whites of the eyes, this is the sclera. Okay, and over the sclera, just on this kind of this front part, that's where the conjunctiva is. So there's actually a layer over the sclera called the conjunctiva. Uh, the front part of the eye, this clear area here, this is called the cornea. Okay, the colored part that you see in someone's eye, that is the iris. The dark spot in the middle, that's an opening, and that's called the pupil. And between the cornea and the iris and, and the pupil, there is a fluid called the aqueous humor. Okay, and this is important because uh, these, uh, the cornea and the aqueous humor and the lens are what help focus the image. So when you're looking out at something, uh, the cornea and the, these fluids and lenses help to focus that image. Um, you have little muscles called uh, ciliary muscles uh, that you're going to see here. These little ciliary or suspensory ligaments here, uh, the ciliary bodies. They help to uh, contract and expand the lens to help you focus. Uh, inside the eyeball, this whole thing is called the eyeball, and inside the eyeball there's actually an, another uh, uh, fluid called the vitreous humor. So if you were to cut into an eye, it would spill out a bunch of fluid, and that's called the vitreous humor, and it also plays a role in focusing the image. Uh, and where the image goes, when you focus the image, if you see something out here, it's focused onto the back of the eye, okay? And it's actually focused upside down and backwards. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But it's focused onto the retina, and the retina is where your photoreceptors are. Okay, so that's uh, so think about the film of a camera. That's where the, that's where you would project the image and develop the image. That's what the retina does. That's where the photoreceptors are that um, pick up the image. Uh, you also have a layer called the choroid, and that is where the uh, vasculature is. So that's the layer that's going to pr provide oxygen and nutrition uh, to the um, retina. The very back of the eye, you have the optic nerve, and you also have something called the optic disc. Uh, and so we'll talk about uh, the role of the optic nerve and the optic disc. Do you remember which nerve optic nerve is? Cranial nerve number two, okay? So when we talk about the uh, vision, we're talking about light. So in order to see, uh, we are perceiving light emission, okay, and this light emission is then going to be uh, reflected from objects and then projected onto our eye, and our eyes respond to the visible portion of light. Um, so if you think about the electromagnetic spectrum, there's a lot of different types. There's UV radiation, there's UV light, there's different wavelengths of light. We only see the visible spectrum, okay, so we can't see like uh, x-rays and uh, UV radiation. And what we see, light is actually packaged in little uh, packets called photons, and they travel in waves, and that's what's traveling through our eye and to our retina. And when it hits the photoreceptors on the back of the eye, it actually causes those to fire off an action potential, and then we're able to uh, make an image. And we'll talk about that um, in just a second. So again, so this light is going to go, it's going to cause a photochemical reaction in our uh, vision receptors, and that um, it's going to cause a signal that then goes to our brain, and then our brain allows us to see. Uh, we have two types of photoreceptors in our eye, in our retina. We have rods and cones, and they respond to different wavelengths. So we have some that respond to uh, uh, low light, so our night vision, and we have some that respond to red and blue and green, um, our day vision. And I'll talk to you about that uh, in just a second. So when we think about the eye, we can divide it into optical components and neural components. And so the optical components are the things that allow us to uh, admit light into the eye and then focus it, okay? So imagine this is my wavelength of light, okay? And it's got to go through the cornea first, okay? Then the aqueous humor, then the lens, then the vitreous humor, and then on to uh, the retina, okay? So think about this question. I, I may say, you know, uh, name the order that light goes through the eye. So it would be the cornea first, then the aqueous humor, then the lens, and then the vitreous humor. And then finally onto the retina. So the neural components, okay, so all, the, all we just talked about, that's just focusing the light onto the retina. So think about a microscope when you're having to focus the image so that you can see it. That's all that the cornea the aqueous humor, the lens, and the vitreous humor are doing. They're focusing the image onto the retina.
okay? Now the retina is where the actual photoreceptors are, okay? And then they're going to converge and send their signal to the optic nerve, and then that's going to go to the brain. Okay, so the neural components in the eye are the retina and the optic nerve. So how do we make an image? All right, so light, okay, the pathway of light, all we're seeing in our world around us is just uh, the reflection of light off of images, okay? And then our brain turns that into something that we recognize. So the pathway of light, again, cornea, aqueous humor, lens, vitreous humor, then the neural layer of the retina, which is all the way back here, uh, to the photoreceptors. And so light is going to be... Uh, refracted or focused, you can use the word focus here, that kind of makes more sense probably, is refracted at the cornea, uh, entering the lens and uh, exiting the lens. Uh, so as an image comes in, the cornea is going to then, so here's, let's just say this is my image, it's going to be uh, focused onto the front of the lens and then again off the back of the lens. So let's just imagine that you're using um, binoculars and you, know, you have the, the uh, piece of glass at the front of the binocular and the piece of glass at the back of the binocular, kind of the same way. That's going to focus that onto your eye so that you can see something far away. It's kind of a similar an, um, analogy. Um, as you change the curvature of the lens, that allows you for fine focusing. So your lens will actually thicken and thin uh, to allow you to focus. That's one of the reasons you lose um, some of your ability to read as you get older. Your lens doesn't respond as well anymore and it's hard to focus, uh, especially uh, close up as you get older. Uh, once that light goes to the retina, then the retina changes that light energy into an action potential. So you're taking light energy and then turning it into that electrical energy, that action potential, which is what the brain uses uh, to perceive the image, and we call that phototransduction. All right, so the formation of, a, of an image, again, the pathway of light is coming through the uh, cornea and the, the humors and the lens all the way back to the, to the retina. Now, it actually has to pass through this neural layer. There's actually a layer here. This is where all the, um, the kind of the axons of these um, photocells are has to pass through here to this neural layer. And this is where uh, your rods and cones are. And these rods and cones contain pigments that respond to different wavelengths of light. So we call this the pigmented layer of the retina. And I'm going to talk to you about what a rod does and what a cone does. Um, so you have these all along uh, your retina. But there is an area right where the optic nerve uh, kind of connects to the eyeball. And that's called the optic disc, and there are no rods and cones in that particular area, area, and so that's called the blind spot. Um, we don't notice the blind spot because our brain kind of fills in that gap. Um, but if you were want to Google, just there at Google blind spot, there's actually some uh, little easy tests you can do where you can kind of uh, do a, um, a perception and figure out where your blind spot is. So you do have it, but your brain fills in those gaps for you. So we don't actually see areas of uh, no vision in our visual field. So uh, if you have some uh, have some time, Google blind spot and uh, you can find find yours. All right. So that neural layer, uh, what this looks like is you have on the very this is the very back of the eye. Okay. So remember the light was coming this way. These are your photoreceptors. Okay. You have rods and cones, okay? So in this picture, the cones are these yellow things. Look kind of like an octopus. <laughs> or No, it actually looks more like a squid. And then you have uh, these uh, purple things. These are your cones. Now, cones are for day vision, color vision, and rods are for black-white vision or night vision, okay? So once the light, whatever wavelength of light it's, it is, um, you know, red or blue or green, hits the, or uh, even low light for rods, hits these um, receptors, then they're going to fire. And then that signal is going to be sent this other way. Okay, so light is traveling in this direction. The uh, sensory output, the signal output, is traveling in the opposite direction. So the signal will then join these bipolar cells. We've talked about that before, how a cell that's bipolar has two things coming off of the cell body. All right. It's going to then synapse with these ganglion cells. And then all these ganglion cells converge to eventually form um, the optic nerve. Okay, And that signal can then go to your brain. 
Now, when we see this image, we talked about refraction, and so this is a, an image of a tree, and so it's going to be focused onto the cornea, okay, then through that aqueous humor, to the lens, to the back of the lens, through the vitreous humor. But what actually happens is it's, uh, it's kind of shrunk and turned upside down and reversed. I know that sounds weird, but the image that's actually projected uh, onto the back of the retina is an image that is upside down and reversed. Okay, so then that image is then carried through the optic nerve to the um, occipital lobe of the brain, which is where your um, optic cortex is, uh, your visual cortex on the back of the brain, and your brain will flip it around. Okay, so it flips the, the image around so that we actually perceive our world in the correct way. Okay, so if the image stopped right there and was carried to your brain that way, it, the world would seem upside down, but luckily for us, our, our brain uh, flips it back around. Um, a lot of people ask me about farsightedness and nearsightedness. Um, nearsightedness is called myopia, and um, all, <coughs> excuse me, all nearsightedness and farsightedness are is the shape of your eyeball. So if your eyeball is uh, too long, then that's going to cause the image to be in front of the retina, okay, so it's going to be out of focus. If you have hyperopnea or farsightedness, then the image is actually projected behind the retina, which is kind of weird. Uh, which means your eyeball is too short. So again, it'll be out of focus. Um, I, I'll talk a little bit about this and how you correct it in another video. Uh, but again, if you're curious about what that means, you can read your book. There's a lot of information about what that means if you happen to have nearsightedness or farsightedness. All right, so let's get back to those rods and cones. Okay, so the rods, these are your dark vision. They're very sensitive to uh, dim light. Um, they're best suited for night vision and also peripheral vision. So one thing I like to do with my students is uh, take your fingers and kind of go out to the side, all right? And there's going to be a point where you really can't see them anymore, okay? And then you should kind of start to move them and then you'll, you'll, you'll see it. Now, you may not be able, you can see the movement, but a lot of times you can't figure out what color it is. You, you, you know there's something there, but you can't distinguish the color. So if I took something um, like this pencil or this pen, it's got red on it, and I move it all the way out to the side, I can see it moving, but I really don't know what color it is, okay? So it's not for color vision, it's just good for peripheral vision. Um, because it's good for night vision and peripheral vision, if you like to go out and look at the stars at night, a lot of times you'll notice uh, when you go out, if you try to look directly at a star, it disappears, okay? But if you look just to the side of it, you can see it. Uh, and so that, that's our rods at work. They, we use our peripheral vision to kind of look just to the side of the star, and then you see it a little bit better. Okay, so you're using your rods at night to, to stargaze. Uh, again, mostly you see in gray tones only, which, again, night vision is usually uh, gray tones. Um, and our rods are not real distinct. Usually things are fuzzy um, and not real clear, so that's your peripheral vision. The rods work because they have a pigment called rhodopsin. And uh, it's actually kind of a dark purple rose-colored um, pigment. So rhodo means rose. So these are it's like a, a rose-colored um, pigment. And so when low light hits it, it fires, and that's how we how the, the rods work. And we have to have those for night vision. Now the cones they um, are for bright light, okay, and color. And so they this is what we use during our day vision. And uh, we have uh, three pigments, and they're called opsins, uh, and they respond to different wavelengths, a blue, a red, and a green uh, wavelength of light. And depending on um, the combination of those wavelengths, you see things like yellow and orange. Remember your old color wheel where you could take different colors and put them together and get other colors? Same, uh, same thing applies with your eye. Uh, your day vision, your cone vision is very detailed, it's very high resolution, okay, so this is what you would use to read. That's why it's, uh, if low light, it's sometimes hard to read, uh, you say, I need, I need light to read because you can't have that very distinct image. So for, you don't want to read in low light, it, it's, uh, it's, um, it's hard, it can give you a headache because we need those cones for reading. Now, we want to talk about dark adaptation and light adaptation. So what I'm saying is night vision and day vision. Uh, and so this is when what dark adaptation is what happens when you move from bright light into darkness, okay? And, of course, it's opposite of light adaptation, which I'll talk to you about in just a second. 
And during dark adaptation, so you're walking outside to go look at the stars. Uh, so now you have low light, so the cones are going to stop functioning. Uh, your pupils are going to dilate to allow as much light as they can in. And your rods are going to uh, turn on. And when I use the word turn on, what I mean is that pigment rhodopsin is going to start to accumulate. And it, uh, as it accumulates, your eyes become more and more and more sensitive. And so you can see better and better and better. And it takes about 30 minutes for you to get enough rhodopsin in your eyes to be able to see at night. So that's why if you go outside and maybe you've gone outside to look at the stars and you, you see four or five stars and then five minutes later you start to see 20 and then 10 minutes later you see hundreds and then 30 minutes later you see thousands. That's because you have a lot of rhodopsin in your um, eyes. A cool trick you can do, take Winto Green Lifesavers. Go into a dark room, okay, or before you even turn the lights off, chomp on them with a mirror and you'll see nothing. Now go into a dark room, turn out the lights, start chomping on them again with a mirror. You may see something, but give it about 10 minutes and all of a sudden you'll see sparks in your mouth. Uh, the way the wintergreen crystals are made when, they, when they're crunched, they give off a, a light and you'll be able to see that once you have enough rhodopsin accumulated um, in your vision, which is about 20 to 30 minutes. Now light adaptation is what, ha is what happens when you go from dark to light. And so this is in the middle of the night, you're, uh, you know, you're sound asleep and somebody flips on the light and you're just, you're kind of temporarily light blind. Uh, you get that glare. That's because as soon as you turn the light on, that completely uh, breaks down their, that rhodopsin, okay? And your pupils constrict and your cones haven't quite turned on yet. So just for just a few seconds, you're just a little bit blind. Everything's kind of white and glary. Uh, and it can take about five or ten minutes for that to improve. Um, think about also going from uh, maybe inside your house to outside on a really bright day and you're kind of blinking and you can't really see. So most of us, what do we do? We just put on sunglasses. But uh, you can wait five or ten minutes and your eyes should adjust to that bright light. All right, last thing I'm going to talk about uh, so this video doesn't get too long is the visual pathway. Uh, so light, again, is going to come uh, from um, the outside through, again, the cornea, the aqueous humor, the lens, the vitreous humor to the lens, all right, and then it's going to converge uh, on the retina, and the retina is going to send those signals to the optic nerve, and the optic nerve is going to carry the information to the brain. Now, what I want you to notice is that information from both eyes actually goes to both sides of the brain. We, temp we tend to think of, of your left side of your brain controlling the right side, right side controlling the left side. Well, in vision, you actually have, here's your left eye, you have some of those nerve tracks go to the right side of the brain, and then um, some stay on the left side. Same thing with your right eye. Um, and so one thing about vision is your right eye has one um, visual field, and your left eye has another visual field, and they merge just a little bit. But our brain is able to kind of... Um, work that out, okay? So we just see one continuous uh, vision of field. But to kind of fit, kind of show you what your brain is doing, take an eye and look at something and close your eye and then close your other eye. And you'll see that, like this pen, it's kind of jumping from side to side. And that shows you that we have two separate fields of vision. But again, your brain rectifies that and makes it one solid piece of um, visual field, okay? Just kind of a cool thing that the brain does. That also allows us to have depth perception. So that's one of the reasons we can have really good depth perception is because we have this uh, merging of those visual fields. Um, I just wanted to sh mention the optic chiasm. This is where the optic nerves cross. And the Greek letter for X, uh, so X in Greek is chi. So it's literally the optic exism. And so that is where your optic nerves um, cross. All right, that's all I'm going to talk about today. That video is long enough, so I will talk to you again about the ear and hearing and equilibrium. Thank you very much.